parishioners and to our valued virtual partners. I'm so glad once again that you're here to join me for another edition of Transformational Bible Study. I hope that your week has been filled with God's favor and that you've begun your year, 2022, on a good note. I pray that you are going to keep moving forward. I hope that you have great anticipation for the unknown because God is about to do some amazing things in your life. I think that it's a very great segue into our new January series entitled Walking in the Spirit. Because if we walk in the Spirit, we can anticipate the things of God. Even though we may not understand it or see it, we still can anticipate it. And so in this session, I want to talk from the subtopic, Living in God's Reality. Paul says something very positive and powerful for our foundational text tonight that is found in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's begin with verse 1 through 5. The Apostle Paul is urging us to live in God's reality, but he phrases it a little different than I do, but it means the same thing. His phrase, the phrase that he uses rather, is walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Look at verse 1. I therefore, speaking of Paul, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your calling. Mm, that one hope that belongs to your calling. He says in verse 5, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. As I begin talking to you tonight, the first instructions for us to what worthy of our glorious identity and calling is that we be unified in Christ, which is built upon proper Christian attitudes and on God's absolute truths. Living in God's reality requires a few aspects which I will address in this study. Let's begin with the basic foundation of God's reality. During Jesus' life, he spoke often about hearing God's word and how God's word can change the momentum of your life. First, I want to show you, I want to talk to you about the fact that it is impossible to live in God's reality without the revelation of God's word. And secondly, God has designed that the revelation of his word comes by and through his Holy Spirit. Now, there is no getting around or bypassing the assignment of the Holy Spirit of God in our life as we are urged to walk with God and walk in the reality of God. Now, God's reality requires, as I said, the knowledge of his word. His word can help us to discern whether or not our desires or our inclinations come from the Holy Spirit. We must test our inclination against the scripture or the holy word of God and trust that the Holy Spirit will never impress upon us to do, say, or think anything that is contrary to the word of God. If what we do conflicts with the Bible, it is not from the Holy Spirit, and I want to challenge you to ignore it now. The New Testament is filled with phrases like the word of God, the spirit of truth, and the word of Christ. When you see these phrases, they are all relative to God's reality. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, the A version of 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. In essence, let the reality of God through his son Jesus take up residence inside of you. Now, the problem that confronts us all today is the fact that God's reality and mankind's reality are based on very different realms. 
we largely, we largely just see and experience the surface of the human experience. Listen, we perceive and experience the external and superficial phenomena of the physical world. And in our ignorance, we believe this to be all that is real. Or let me say it another way. In our ignorance, we believe this to be all that reality is. But let me tell you right now, it is not. Paul has written on the subject of being ignorant many times. He wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and points out that we should not be ignorant. Now, help me. let me help you understand this. The word ignorant is found 17 times in the Bible, and it simply means without knowledge. It is not meant to be an insulting term. It just means that you don't know something. I think I said it on last week. Our biggest problems is that we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> so in our ignorance of the things of God, we begin to build a reality that's not on the level of God's reality. We are so often caught up in the daily struggle of survival and the endless search for satisfaction and meaning that we have neither the time nor the inclination to look beyond what appears to be real and what appears to fulfill our immediate needs. And so we focus on those things, which is why some of us are afraid or indifferent to let God's word speak to us which is the greatest hindrance to us walking in the, rea in the reality of God. Now, when we take time to stop moving so frantically throughout life and we become still or practice the stillness of God for a moment and allow ourselves to be silent and hear God, we will then be able to sense something that is deeper, something that is more fulfilling in our life. Consider what Jesus said in John chapter 16. It is very introspective to our topic on living in God's reality. After predicting his death, Jesus promises to send the advocate, that is, the Holy Spirit. Jesus describes what the Holy Spirit will do and why he is necessary. Go with me to John chapter 16, verse 12 through 14. Here's what it says. The very first verse, chapter 12 says, I still, speaking of Jesus, speaking to them, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Oh my God, listen, it's a lot inside there. That is the why. They were not complete. They were missing a critical life companion that will make it possible to comprehend the next level of God's reality for them. Notice verse 13. Who or what was the missing companion? Verse 13 tells us, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, as I read these scriptures, I can hear Jesus saying, in effect, don't let others tell you what is real. Don't let anyone define or reduce reality for you. One of the most recent lies concerning world, the world's reality is what's flooding our TV network. It is called reality shows. Let me just start and start with this. I want to get this off of my chest. Reality TV shows are not reality. Please let me say it again. I need to get this off my chest. <laughs> reality TV shows are not reality. Please hear this. Because again, this is a this is, reality requires another realm of living. Most of what you see on TV is not reality. I'm gonna say it again. Most of what you see on TV is not at all reality. Reality, as it relates to Jesus Christ, is living life 
on a whole nother realm. Listen, John, Jesus' beloved disciple, explained the difference in God's reality and the world's. In 1 John chapter 3, look with me in verse 18 through verse 20. I'm reading from the Message Bible. It begins with real love. What do I mean? God's reality begins with real love. He said, my dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we are living, truly living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. <laughs> For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. Listen to me, people of God. Once God's reality of love is taken care of, we are no longer accusing and condemning ourselves. We are in the reality of God's freedom from condemnation, and we are free to be bold. We are free to be courageous. We are free to be victorious, and we are able to stretch out our hands and receive the predestined blessings that are assigned to our lives. Why? Because we are doing what God says what God requires of us, and what is pleasing to Him. Now, God's reality is a broader reality. Imagine what, what is really real outside of our natural and our physical comprehension. Imagine how things could be now if we could see the world through God's eyes. That's what Jesus said in verse 12 and 13. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. In essence, the Holy Spirit is critical to qualifying us and giving us the ability to receive truth on another level, which is the reality of God. God chose our human spirit commingled with his divine spirit to be the place of worship, to be the place of understanding, to be the place of resource for living in his reality. Now, without the advocate, without the Holy Spirit, we are incapable of such a life. God's word of truth infused into us nurtures divine reality in us. It is at this point that God's truth embedded, if we are embracing God's truth, if it is embedded in our heart, if it is embedded in our mind, it is at this point that God's truth become our renewed human reality, which enables us to walk in God's reality. Now listen, I need you to hear me tonight. God's word of truth is not just doctrine. Let me say it again. God's word of truth is not just doctrine. It is the reality of the triune Godhead. We need to see that the Father is embedded in the Son and the Son is realized as the Spirit and the Spirit is one with the Word. Now, when we come to the Word of God, we can touch the Spirit through the Word of God and something is infused inside our innermost being. This is the living truth being infused inside of us. It is the Holy Spirit of God, my dear friend, who is one with God's Word that responds to all of our human actions and responds to all of our needs inside of life. Now, our first power thought today is a statement I quote often from the evangelist teacher, D.L. Moody, who said this, You might as well try to see without eyes, hear without ears, or breathe without lungs as to try to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. Oh my God, I think that speaks volumes to our study tonight. Because when a person believes in Christ, 
The Holy Spirit immediately becomes a permanent part of their life. Whether you recognize him or not, he becomes a permanent resident and a permanent part of our life. Notice the Apostle Paul's record of this in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's begin reading at verse 17 and we'll read through to verse 24. Paul writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of the heart. They have become callous and they have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Notice verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Oh, let me repeat it again. Verse 20. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and the true holiness. Listen, one of my favorite things I like about the Apostle Paul is his ability to weave together theology with a call to practical application for living in the reality of God. This call to obedience requires that we walk in a very particular way, not like we walked previously. We are called to walk in the light of the great truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul warns believers that we must no longer walk like Gentiles. It is important that we take this exhortation seriously as the Apostle Paul prefaces his instructions with a solemn charge. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord. Now, this is necessary and very important. I'm going to say it again. This is a necessary and a very important reminder as we read and reflect upon the words written in the scriptures. We must recognize and remember, my dear friend, that these words are issued from the very mouth of God. It is God's reality to us. And Paul reminds us of this important fact. He writes and testifies, he says, on behalf of God. Every time I preach and teach, I do it on behalf of of an almighty God. Every time you read the word of God, every time you begin to walk the word of God, to talk the word of God, to testify the word of God, to reveal the word of God to others, you are speaking from the very mouth of God. The Christian life requires a decisive break with our past. This is what enables us to live in God's reality. It requires, once again, a decisive break from our path. Paul will go on to instruct us to put off our old self and instead put on our new self. Despite the decisiveness of this break, it is important to remember who we were before Christ rescued us and brought us from death to life. And so even in Paul's exhortation to break with the past, he said that we, and I quote, must no longer walk as, speaking of the previous life, as the Gentiles do. There is a reminder there of who we once were. Now, indeed, Paul here uses the same imagery he earlier employed in order to describe the gloriousness of Christ's intervention on our behalf. If you will, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 1 through 6. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world 
following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But pay attention to verse four. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, he says, you have been saved and raised up with him, oh, you better get this, my dear friend, and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen, I want to leave this final thought with you. In essence, what Paul was writing here and what God was declaring through Paul is that living in God's reality means that we level up the view of ourselves because we've been raised up with him. I want you to write that down. I'm going to level up my view of myself because I've been raised up with God. Here's the next thing I want to leave with you. And we walk in divine authority because we have been seated with him in heavenly places. Oh my God, this is living in God's reality. Can I say these two things again? Because I want you to embrace them as I close. Living in the reality of God means that we're leveling up our view of ourselves because we've been raised up with him and we walk in divine authority and dominion, my dear friend, because we have been seated with him in heavenly places. Can somebody say amen tonight? Listen, this is just the beginning of our study of walking in the spirit and it really living inside the God's reality that God has intended for us. And this is all I have for you this evening. And I want you to go away. I want you to reread it. I want you to restudy it. I want you to embrace what it means to live in God's reality. Because this is concluding our study tonight. It's not concluding your study. And so I want to challenge you to continue to go deeper. I want to challenge you to begin to live your life differently than you've lived it before. Listen, 2020 and 2021, that was then. 2022, this is now. I want to challenge you to say this with me. I am going to live 2022 in God's reality. God bless you. Listen, I want to conclude this study tonight. I pray that I have informed and inspired and transformed you in a way that's going to help you level up. Because as my assignment as a pastor teacher, and I always say, and I will always say this, is that it's for me to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all come into the unity of the faith. Bow your heads in a word of prayer with me as we conclude this study tonight, and I pray that it's been a blessing to you. Father, we submit and consecrate our lives to you, our body, souls, and our spirits tonight. And we put them all under your authority. God, we pray that you help us to commune with you in love. And we pray that you help us to show that love to each other and embrace each other in love. God, we long to know you more and to be used by you and to minister the gospel to the world that is in such desperate need of you. But Father, help us to understand first how to walk in the reality of your word in the reality of scripture. Help us to be a model for the world. Father, we pray that you make our thoughts, our words, our attitudes and our actions, may they be a testimony of the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Father, may your truth mightily flow through us, dear Father, and from our lips as words of encouragement. And Father, that we may edify the body of Christ as you have edified us. Dear Father, we pray that you will lead us, that you will help us to love and to live a life that is led according to your word and by your word and where your grace abound and may it be obvious and may your praise be obvious in us and may your great treasures flow from us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray all of this. And right now, dear God, I pray for those who may be suffering, those that are struggling tonight. 
God, we pray healing upon their life. We pray deliverance upon their life tonight. We break the strongholds inside of their life. And God, we pray right now that you will wash them and make them clean, that you will cover them with your precious blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. Help us, dear God, as we take this word to the street. Help us, dear God, as we live this word in 2022. God, tonight we give it all to you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Listen, good night and God bless you. I pray that you take this word to the street. Take it with you this week and learn how to live in God's reality. This is all for right now. I hope to see you again next week. And remember this, you are the most awesome people in all of the world. And Lady Catherine and I, we love you dearly. And there's nothing you can do about it. Go in peace and go in love and have an absolutely amazing week in Jesus Christ. I will see you back here, same time, same place, next week for another edition of Transformational Bible Study. God bless you.